Today, we're beginning a brand new series called The History of Microsoft. Travel with us back in time as we discover the roots of one of the world's most important technology companies, year by year. Using rare videos and photos, see how it all started in Albuquerque, New Mexico, with only six employees. Since then, Microsoft has seen hundreds of products shipped, billions of lines of code written, innovations, breakthroughs, and research that has changed all of our lives. Come with us now as we start our historical journey back to where it all begins, 1975. <laughs> Welcome to the history of Microsoft. The year was 1975. Everyone was singing along with Glenn Campbell to Rhinestone Cowboy. A movie starring a fish by a little known director named Steven Spielberg terrifies and entertains audiences everywhere. And Sony introduced the home video cassette recorder. But that was just the beginning for what was about to happen in the world of communications and technology. On January 1st, 1975, the Mitz Altair 8800 appeared on the cover of Popular Electronics inspiring two young men, Paul Allen and Bill Gates, to develop basic language software for it. Shortly after, on February 1, 1975, Bill Gates and Paul Allen complete Altair Basic and sell it to their very first customer, MITS of Albuquerque, New Mexico. This is the very first computer language program for a personal computer. A major milestone uh, for us was when we were walking through Harvard Square one time and saw this popular electronics magazine. And it was kind of, in a way, you know, good news, bad news. Here was someone making a computer around this chip in exactly the way that uh, Paul had talked to me and you know, we thought about what kind of software could be done for it. And it was happening without us. Um, and for all we knew, maybe they had some software people. They were just going to go charge off and do this thing. And so we we wrote these, this company immediately and uh, offered to do a basic for them. And they thought that was interesting. They called back and said, well, you're serious. You know, we have a lot of strange people calling us because this article um, received immense uh, interest. I mean, the idea of a kit computer, even though there was really nothing you could do with it. I mean, there's, there's no teletype hookup in the early days. There's no software for it. All you could do is use these switches actually use them here, and key things in into this front panel and you know, maybe do a little program that does things in the lights. Or actually a guy named Steve Dompier discovered that because this bus is unterminated, if you're very clever about the program you run, you can get uh, high frequency emission that can cause a radio to make interesting noises. Now eventually we did get controllers for teletypes and uh, cassette tapes and uh, uh, floppy disks, that kind of thing. But in the early days, it's pretty useless. People just bought it thinking that it would be neat to build a computer. Because we'd never had the chip, just the book from Intel, if we'd made any mistake in terms of how the instructions worked, it never, the thing never would have run. And so Paul was scheduled to fly out to Albuquerque. He decided to go get some sleep. I stayed up all night reading the book to see if we'd miscoded some of the instructions and finally decided it was all okay, punch out the paper tape, and made sure Paul got that before he went off on his plane. He wrote the bootstrap loader, that is the thing you have to key in to make this computer smart enough to know to go get data off the uh, teletype to read it into memory. He wrote that on the plane on the way out. Uh, it was actually 46 bytes, the first one. I eventually wrote one in, in 17 bytes, but anyway. Um, and he took the basic to uh, MITS. They had a machine they, they had run with a 6K of memory, which for them was a big, big thing, um, and loaded it up in the paper tape. The first time, for some reason, it didn't work. The second time, they loaded in, and it worked. And, of course, the simulator, it's very slow because you go through lots of instructions to a single instruction. So actually, the real machine, even though it's such a simple little microprocessor, was faster than our PDP-10 simulator about five times faster. And so to Paul, when it finally came up and it said, OK, uh, actually that first version said ready. Most basics, when they're, they're ready, they say ready. Later when I was squeezing bytes out, I thought, well, it's faster to print 
um, okay, and it's kind of a nice, friendly word, so I, I shortened it to okay a, a little later. Anyway, so it came up, said ready, and he typed in a program. You know, print 2 plus 2, it worked. He had it print out squares and sums and, and things like that. And he and Ed Roberts, the head of this company, sat there, and they were amazed by, you know, that this thing worked. I mean, Paul was amazed that, that our part had worked, and, and Ed was amazed that his hardware worked, and that here it was doing something even useful. Another month passed and Paul Allen is on the move. On March 1st, the young man from the Northwest joined MITS as director of software. And on April 7th, 1975, the headline of the first edition of MITS Computer Notes reads, Altair Basic Up and Running. Wasting no time on July 1st, Bill Gates and Paul Allen officially shipped Basic Version 2.0 in both 4K and 8K editions. Yeah, this Basic was the first um, real piece of software ever written for a, a PC. And it, it became, for the first generation of PCs, the thing that unlocked the power that was there because although some people did machine language programming, 90% of what got done was done in, in uh, BASIC and 90% and of that was Microsoft BASIC, the descendants of this tape that got onto all those early machines. Just a few weeks later, Paul Allen and Bill Gates signed a licensing agreement with MITS regarding the basic interpreter. It was the year 1975. The average cost of bread was 69 cents, gas was 53 cents a gallon, and the partnership yet to be officially named Microsoft declared yearly sales totaling $16,005. But childhood friends Paul Allen and Bill Gates had just begun the adventure of a lifetime, and soon they'd be taking the rest of the world with them. It was the year 1976. A Viking spacecraft shows the first pictures of the rocky desert terrain on Mars. Hotel California topped the charts, giving the Eagles one of the biggest selling albums of all time, and the United States government issued the first of the now obscure $2 bill. And on February 3rd, 1976, Bill Gates took a stand by writing and publishing a letter in computer notes. He accused hobbyists of stealing software and pointed out that if they didn't start paying for the product, there would be no incentive to make software available to them. He then added his address and suggested they pay up or make suggestions. This made Bill Gates the first of many programmers to bring the piracy of software and its effect on the industry to light. In a certain sense, if things hadn't worked out, I could always go back to school. I was officially on leave. I didn't have, like, uh, a family to, to feed or anything. But I was... Uh, doing the payroll, writing the taxes, doing the contracts, figuring out how to price the software. In fact, I was business-oriented enough that I wrote a, a letter about software piracy, uh, sort of complaining that a lot of these computer groups weren't paying for their software. And that really became a cause celeb at the time of, you know, is it fair that this guy's asking for money? Should we pay for this stuff? MITS was very controversial because some of the memory boards they had been shipping didn't work, and they'd been late with a lot of things. So some people felt like it was a way of getting back at MITS to, to take the basic. And we had the first computer convention. There people came in. So we, Microsoft was a business uh, from the, the beginning. Not that we had any uh, clear view that it would ever be a large business, but you know, I had to pay my these friends I'd hired. At a minimum, I had to make enough money to write their paycheck, and if I got enough confidence we could sell a lot more, then I'd be able to hire in even more people to, to get ahead, to be the leader in doing lots of products that could share code with each other and you know, take, take the market. A few months later, on March 27th, Albuquerque, New Mexico hosted the first annual World Altair Computer Convention with an opening address from Bill Gates. The very next month, Microsoft was proud to hire their first official full-time employee. His name was Mark McDonald. Meanwhile, in California, a loan for $5,000 was granted to Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, who were running a small company known as Apple. With emerging interest in technology, new magazines Byte, Computer Graphics and Art, and Dr. Dobbs' Journal of Computer Calisthenics and Orthodontia hit the stands and Microsoft's first advertisement appeared in the July issue of Digital Design Magazine. That summer, Shugart developed a small five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive for microcomputers at a price of 390 bucks. A few months later on September 1st, Microsoft shows signs of growth 
by leasing office space in Albuquerque, New Mexico's Two Park Central Tower Building. Now with an official Microsoft workspace, in November 1976, Paul Allen decided to resign from MITS to join Microsoft full-time. And over the course of 1976, the name Microsoft is variously written. It wasn't until the trade name registration in November that the company settled on how to spell its own name. And Microsoft was finally registered in the state of New Mexico. 1976 was a big year in the U.S. as it celebrated its bicentennial and Microsoft's first year officially known as Microsoft ended with an office, an employee headcount totaling six people, and revenues adding up to more than $22,000. But having an office name was just the beginning for this new company in New Mexico called Microsoft. It was the year 1977. The much-awaited space opera Star Wars became an instant success with robot co-stars C-3PO and R2-D2. New York City celebrated the completion of their new landmark, the World Trade Center, and sadly, the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, died at age 42. It was the year 1977, and while the U.S. began four years with its 39th president, on February 3, 1977, Paul Allen and Bill Gates finally executed an official partnership. That summer, Microsoft introduced its second language product, Fortran 80, at a price of $500. And the Tandy Corporation announced the TRS-80 Model 1 microcomputer with a 4K memory retailing for $600. Meanwhile, Apple, another small tech company, released their second version of a personal computer called the Apple II. And the market was growing as Commodore business machines hit the market with the personal electronic transactor computer, otherwise known as PET. A few months later, on September 13th, Microsoft received new computers from Commodore, Radio Shack, and Texas Instruments. The Altair uh, Basic comes out in 75. And the next big wave is a set of three machines that come out in 77. Uh, this, the TRS-80, the Apple II uh, that we have over here that came out actually without the disks at first, uh, and a machine called the Commodore PET. And those were low cost, and yet they, were, they weren't kits or anything. They came out prepackaged, and they looked like they would really ignite the volume in the market. And all three of them went out and did very well. Um, several of them, when they first shipped, he had basics that the company themselves did. This had a, a level one basic that actually Steve Leininger uh, enhanced off of Lee Chim Wang's uh, tiny basic. But they knew it was pretty inadequate, and so they licensed the uh, basic from us that was built into all these machines thereafter, and they called it level two basic, and we even left some hooks in there so we could sell uh, a, a basic called level three basic that went even further. So Radio Shack with its distribution and its name uh, set the market on fire. Apple, because they really went out to computer dealers and did a, a good job, far better than people like uh, the MITS guys and the Insight guys were doing. They really thought of this as a market where they had to develop the channel and do new things. And the Commodore machine, the PET, was actually the most aggressively priced machine and had, had some very innovative things. So these machines drove the market and uh, uh, eventually, by uh, a year after they were out, all of them had our basic built in. So you could even move programs back and forth between the, these machines because of the the compatibility that we had built in there. With new momentum and equipment, on September 26th, Microsoft expanded to three more offices in their Albuquerque building. Well, Paul uh, and I were the founders, uh, but uh, we, during the time we were in Albuquerque, which was from 75 to 78, ended up with about 16 people. Uh, this is a picture we took towards the end of that time, myself and Paul. Uh, this is Gordon Letwin, who uh, had worked and did the uh, Heath Basic, Benton Harbor Basic, and then he was upset when they were licensing my Basic. Instead, he came to work for us and did some incredible work. Uh, Mark McDonald, actually our first employee. Anyway, these were the uh, other than uh, Andrea, who wrote the manuals, and Marla, who uh, helped keep the books. Uh, I was the sales department, contract department, and everybody else here uh, were programmers. We all wrote an immense amount of code. You know, these were, were exciting years. The number of new machines coming out uh, were, pretty, were pretty dramatic. Our offices were here in uh, 
uh, fancy Albuquerque up on the eighth floor of, of this building here. Uh, Albuquerque was great. There weren't many distractions there, but it was hard to recruit people as we, we tried to grow. It was the year 1977. The median income in the United States was over $13,000, and Microsoft's revenue went up significantly this year to over $380,000. The year was 1979. Margaret Thatcher was the first woman to be elected to Prime Minister in Britain, the Seattle Supersonics won the NBA championship, and Sony introduced the first portable Walkman. But music wasn't the only thing on the move. On January 1st, 1979, Microsoft relocated from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and headed closer to home for Bill Gates and Paul Allen to Bellevue, Washington. Now, while Microsoft settles into their new place, they're still busy building, and on March 12th, they announced an M6800 version of BASIC. Less than one month later, on April 4th, the 8080 version of Microsoft BASIC is the very first microprocessor software product to win the ICP Million Dollar Award. But there's little time to stop and celebrate. Microsoft BASIC currently in use in over 200,000 Z80 and 8080 installations has just been released in a new version for the 8086 16-bit microprocessor. Well, the key to the, the move to the business market was getting a machine with more capability and getting a uh, standard. Uh, although you could exchange some basic programs between these 8-bit machines, uh, if you went and used any of the advanced features, uh, then you were just tied to that one machine. So it wasn't all that economical to write lots of software for these machines. And the 8-bit the machines maxed out at 64K of memory. And even though you know, when I wrote BASIC in 4K, 64K seemed like a lot, as we started taking on more and more challenges, it just wasn't going to be enough. And since we were tracking what Intel was doing uh, very closely and building the next generation chip, their 8086 family, including the very low cost part called the 8088, we knew that 16-bit computing was on its way. And we saw that it could be a, a good business machine, and we decided to focus a lot of early work on that that Intel chip. In fact, it was that decision that forced us to do the soft card because we had so many products for the Intel chip, and the question was, should we spread those products over to other 8-bit chips, like the 6502 that runs in here, or should we immediately move up and do 16-bit software? And I said, no, we're going to do 16-bit software. Everybody was a little bit disappointed because it meant we wouldn't be able to sell onto these machines. And that's when Paul invented the idea of, of the soft card so that we could actually take our, our Intel software and run it on this machine and at the same time go ahead and devote our resources to being way ahead of everybody else in developing uh, software for the 8086. Continuing with the momentum, that August Microsoft announced the availability of Microsoft Basic Compiler for 8080 and Z80 CPM systems. Now, Microsoft isn't the only tech company making news in 1979. Visical, with the first electronic spreadsheet program, debuts at the West Coast Computer Fair. And the first compact disks are created by Sony in Japan and Philips in the Netherlands, thanks to joint licensing. Now, as Microsoft enters the holidays, they begin to make more international news. On November 29, 1979, Microsoft expanded the European market by opening a new representative, Vector Microsoft, located in Belgium. One month later, on December 1st, the most powerful BASIC written for the TRS-80, Level 3 BASIC, was introduced by Microsoft Consumer Products, their new consumer software development and marketing division. It was the year 1979. Convicted felon Patty Hearst was released from prison, thanks to Jimmy Carter, and at Microsoft, all the work and risks were paying off. Now, with 28 employees, Microsoft ended the year 1979 with sales exceeding $2 million. Now with a new home, an ICP Million Dollar Award, and a handful of new talent, Microsoft prepares to enter the new decade and plans on proving that it's here to stay. It was the year 1980. Mount St. Helens erupted in Washington State, covering the surrounding areas in ash. Ordinary People, starring Mary Tyler Moore, won the Oscar for Best Picture. And President Carter declared a U.S. boycott of the Olympic Games in protest of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And in 1980, Microsoft was ready to start the new decade with a bang. And on the first day of the year, consumers were in awe as Microsoft announced its first consumer-oriented application software, 
Typing Tutor. A few months later on April 2nd, Microsoft introduced the Z80 Soft Card, a circuit board that plugs into the Apple II computer, allowing Apple users to run CPM applications with only minor modifications. Then in June, Microsoft gets a new hire, a charismatic young man named Steve Ballmer. He's responsible for handling operations, including personnel, finance, and the legal areas of the ever-growing business. About a year after that, I hired a friend of mine from college, Steve Ballmer, who was very good at hiring people. And so he could see that we, were, we had more projects that we wanted to do than we could. And he was able to almost double the size of the company and people every year for the next five years. So it really started to change in character where I had you know, written a high percentage of the code myself until we got to Seattle and reviewed you know, everything that people were doing to the point where um, you know, we were setting up a lot of autonomous teams and having to do a lot more in terms of what, what was our methodology and how did we interview people uh, just to, to stay up with all the uh, projects we were going after. When Steve came in, um, I was spending more time with him because the, the business side was important, managing and organizing, uh, and what were we going to do about international. And so uh, it was great that Steve was smart enough and personal enough that even though he didn't have a technical background, the programmers accepted him. That was very rare. We, we really didn't believe non-programmers should manage programmers. And we didn't do that until I think it was 83 before Steve actually directly managed developers. But the developers accepted him early on because he, he was smart. He would sit and listen to them, um, understand the things that they really liked to do. And so that, that fit in. I got a lot of benefit out of, uh, of Steve going around and always knowing what, what people were, were thinking about. Two months later, on August 25th, Microsoft announced a portable Unix-based operating system for 16-bit microprocessors called Xenix OS. Now, while Microsoft was busy going portable, Apple was busy going public. With 4.6 million shares, it was the largest offering since Ford Motor Company went public in 1956. In October, IBM hired Paul Allen and Bill Gates to create an operating system for a new personal computer. Microsoft took the deal and bought the rights for a simple operating system developed by Tim Patterson at Seattle Computer Products to use as a basis for the new code. In addition to hiring Microsoft, IBM allowed Paul Allen and Bill Gates to keep the marketing rights to the operating system known as DOS. In 1980, computer software hit high gear. There was Olympic Decathlon, the game, MSORT, and RamCard, memory expander for Apple II. It was the year 1980. Microsoft employed 40 people and ended the year with sales totaling $8 million. In five short years, Bill Gates and Paul Allen, along with their growing team, turned a small business into a huge success. And the new decade offered many new opportunities for the company slowly becoming a household name. The year was 1981. John Lennon and Yoko Ono won a Grammy for Best Album with Double Fantasy. The top grossing film was Raiders of the Lost Ark with $115 million. And Ronald Reagan took the oath as the 40th President of the United States of America. And for Microsoft, 1981 would prove to be a stellar year filled with enormous growth. On April 9, 1981, Microsoft holds the first semi-annual company meeting in the newly built Bellevue Athletic Club. And a few months later, on June 25th, Microsoft reorganizes into a privately held corporation, with Bill Gates as president and chairman of the board and Paul Allen as executive vice president. Microsoft becomes Microsoft Incorporated, an incorporated business in the state of Washington. But Microsoft isn't the only company making strides in the tech industry. Osborne Computer introduces the Osborne One. It's the first portable microcomputer. And in world news, Pope John Paul II is wounded by a gunman. And on May 2nd, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control published a report which officially announces the start of the AIDS epidemic. On August 12, 1981, IBM introduces its personal computer, MS-DOS version 1.0 plus BASIC, COBOL, PASCAL, and other Microsoft products. This is Microsoft's entry into the operating systems business. Included in the IBM compatible list of software is a game newly adapted to the PC. It's called Microsoft Adventure. 
How easy was it to get information on what was coming ahead? Were people open in those days, or were they pretty secretive? Well, there was no, no secrecy at all, at least as far as I could detect. Uh, some of the computer shows, like the West Coast Computer Fair, everybody in the industry would be there and sit down. And there was so much to do, we, weren't, we were overlapping each other some, and there was some good rivalry, but uh, not uh, in a sense that people were keeping lots of secrets about what they were up to. And you know, it was a very exciting uh, business at that time. Intel was a customer for our basic. They'd come out and asked us to, to do some custom work, and I remember telling them I could do it in two weeks, and they said, don't say that, don't say that. Say, say four months, say something reasonable. And it turned out it took four weeks to do, because actually configuring their system was so hard. But uh, we'd gotten to know Intel, and we're talking about where the uh, uh, chips were going. It just, it was a very small group that sort of shared this secret. In fact, Ted Nelson gave a speech at one of the West Coast computer fairs about how we were going to overthrow all the big computer companies, and we really knew that it was power to the individual, and uh, there was a little bit of a, um, you know, kind of a minority feel that we, we had to uh, advance this cause, and eventually everybody would realize we were right about what was going on with these machines. On October 1st, 1981, Microsoft continues to expand, and the Microsoft building, the Northup building, located on Northup Way in Bellevue, Washington, is leased. And this move proved to be a creative one as well. Rumor has it that at one point, a programmer would name a portion of his Windows code after the drive-in restaurant Burger Master, which could easily be seen from the new Northup location, as it was the first thing he saw when he looked out of his window. As Microsoft rolled into the holidays, it announced it had signed a letter of intent to enter a second source agreement with Santa Cruz Operation Incorporated for the Xenix operating system. The year 1981 ended with sales totaling over $17 million for Microsoft, and Microsoft sought a hire of some notable employees, including Jeff Rakes, Tandy Trower, Chris Peters, and the 100th employee, Ellen Acock. Reaching 100 employees is a milestone for any company. But for Microsoft, things are about to get much, much bigger. <laughs>